One aspect of GDI's armed forces that consistently outclassed the Brotherhoods during the three major Tiberium Wars was its Air Force. GDI's Air Force consisted of a variety of aircraft, from transports, to bombers, to gunships. I've already done a separate video covering the most famous of these craft, the Orcas. So for this video, I'll be covering all the non-Orca aircraft in their arsenal. I'll also be omitting spacecraft, as I plan to do a separate video on those in the future. During the First Tiberium War, both GDI and the Brotherhood used many of the same aircraft. This was largely due to the Brotherhood's secret connections with various defense contractors, who also provided aircraft to GDI. One helicopter that was carried over from the Second World War between the Allies and Soviet Union was the CH-47 Chinook. During the war, Chinooks were used to transport infantry, supplies, and equipment to bases and battlefields across Europe. They were largely seen transporting infantry across rivers, or bringing reinforcements to the front line. The Chinooks used in the First Tiberium War performed the same exact roles. They were used by GDI as part of the organization's campaign to expel the Brotherhood of Nod from Europe. The helicopter saw additional use in Africa as part of the Brotherhood's campaign to take over the continent. The helicopter was capable of landing on helipads, which allowed it to refuel and load up on supplies or infantry. A Chinook could even land on a service depot to repair any damage it sustained from anti-air weapon systems. A variant of the Chinook was used by both GDI and the Brotherhood, one that closely resembled the CH-46 Sea Knight. There are a few differences between the Sea Knight and the Chinook, though I'll be focusing largely on the in-game differences here. In particular, the Sea Knight only had three landing legs compared to the Chinook's four, with the two rear legs held in the large sponsons on each side of the Sea Knight. The Chinook also had a more pronounced nose compared to the Sea Knight. The Sea Knights are typically armed with a machine gun on each side of the helicopter, right behind the cockpit. They can also be seen airlifting light and sometimes medium armored vehicles onto the battlefield. Both the Chinook and the Sea Knight were lightly armored, and could be easily taken out by anti-air weapons such as SAM turrets and man pads. UH-60 Blackhawk helicopters were used by both GDI and the Brotherhood, though seemingly not as much as the Chinooks. Though this is largely based on the fact that only a couple of cutscenes featured the Blackhawk. So perhaps the helicopter was used extensively throughout the First War, but we just don't get a chance to actually see it in-game. GDI's primary ground attack plane was the A-10 Thunderbolt II. This airplane was typically called in by commanders who had successfully cleared the battlefield of Nod SAM sites. One or two of these A-10s would fly in, dropping napalm bombs onto the designated target. This strike was devastating to bunched up troops and vehicles, and could even level some Nod buildings. The A-10 had resilient armor, and could not be easily shot down by Nod rocket soldiers. Of course, the A-10 was most famous for its Gao 8A Avenger autocannon, which could fire large, depleted uranium shells at a rapid rate. The cannon was designed to take out a variety of targets, including armor. Unfortunately, the A-10s in-game did not make use of this weapon. GDI used FA-18 Hornets as their primary multi-role fighter. They could only be seen in cutscenes, such as one being shot down by a Nod SAM turret. Another scene shows the shadows of two F-18s flying over a sundial somewhere in West Africa, dropping parabombs onto enemy forces near the sundial. Yet another cutscene shows an F-18 performing a bombing run on the Nod base, in order to cover retreating GDI forces. The last cutscene shows an F-18 performing a bombing run from the monitor of an enemy battle station, before this station is successfully destroyed. A few other aircraft in GDI's arsenal at this time include what looks to be an E-2 Hawkeye AEW aircraft. This plane was only in one cutscene though, crashing into a village. Another is an unnamed fighter plane seen in two cutscenes. The first one shows this plane pursuing and shooting down a Brotherhood F-22 Raptor. The second cutscene was taken from the viewpoint of a Nod SAM turret as it shoots down this fighter. 
The last of these other aircraft was a transport plane, one that paratroopers could be observed bailing out of in a cutscene. This plane is a strange one, as the fuselage and tail is that of a C-130, but the nose resembles a C-5 galaxy. The propellers on each wing are close together, whereas the propellers of a C-130 are a little further apart from each other. So it appears that this is either a unique unnamed plane, similar to the fighter, or it's an inaccurately modeled C-130. In my opinion, the plane is supposed to be a C-130, but whether due to graphics limitations or time constraints, the developers weren't able to create a more accurate model. Now, before I move on to the second Tiberium War, I want to say that I don't think all these aircraft were the only ones in GDI's arsenal during the first war. I think it makes sense that GDI would have a wide variety of aircraft, including F-16s, Panavia Tornadoes, B-1 Lancers, and other aircraft largely seen in Western militaries. Additionally, since Russia was a part of GDI, it would probably make sense for the organization to utilize MiGs, just like GDI's use of Mammoth tanks, which themselves were originally from Russia. During the Second Tiberium War, nearly all aircraft in GDI's Air Force were Orcas. This included the Orca Fighter, Orca Bomber, Transport, and Carry All. There was one non-Orca aircraft that was used, simply called the Dropship. The Dropship was the largest of GDI's aircraft, with the exception of the Kodiak, a craft with spaceflight capabilities. Whether the Dropship itself was capable of spaceflight, I'm not quite sure. The fact that it's called the Dropship seems to indicate that it's capable of reaching low Earth orbit. But there's no information in-game or in the manual mentioning the craft being capable of such a feat. So for this video, I'm going to assume the Dropship has no spaceflight capabilities, but that it is capable of high-altitude long-range flight, similar to that of the SR-71 Blackbird. The Dropship was designed to carry the heaviest of GDI's vehicles, including the MCV and Mammoth Mark II Walker. Infantry and smaller vehicles like the Wolverines or Titan Mark I's would be carried at large containers attached to the bottom of the dropship. The dropship was a VTOL craft with four engines, which allowed it to land almost anywhere. It reminds me of the C-5 Galaxy in that it seems like the craft would require a crew of seven, a pilot and co-pilot, two flight engineers, and three loadmasters. After the Second Tiberium War, the dropship was retired from service as part of the cutbacks to GDI's military funding. But both the dropship and carryall would be replaced by a new VTOL craft called the V-35 Ox. Ox here, need a lift? The V-35 had a pilot and co-pilot at the cockpit. It had a large tail and two thrust vectored engines. On the belly and front sides of the craft were clamps that it used to pick up vehicles or the containers that were used to carry infantry and supplies. So long as an airfield was nearby, any GDI infantry squad could call on a V-35 to their location for pickup. The infantry would drop flares so the V-35 pilots could find them. The Oxes would carry these squads in containers and drop them off almost anywhere on the battlefield. Some vehicle crews would request pickup from Ox airlifters as well though not all could or would be picked up. The Ox wanted to pick up the Rig, Juggernaut, Harvester, Titan Mark II, Mammoth Tank, and of course, the Marv. Interestingly, the Ox was capable of carrying a mobile construction vehicle, as seen at the beginning of the mission by GDI to retake the White House from the Brotherhood. But if the V-35 could lift a large vehicle like the MCV, then surely it is more than capable of lifting a Harvester or Rig. Putting gameplay mechanics to the side, it makes more sense to me that the Ox could lift the Harvester, Rig, and maybe even the Titan Mark IIs, while not being able to lift the Juggernaut, Mammoth Tank, MCB, and Marv, since those would be too large and heavy. Besides picking up and carrying infantry and vehicles, already present on the battlefield, GDI commanders could call in reinforcements, transported by V-35s, from outside the battlefield. GDI airborne units would be dropped off by way of four Oxes and included a couple of veteran riflemen and missile squads. Veteran sharpshooter teams could also be airlifted in to deal with Nod commanders who relied heavily on infantry. Similar to the airborne, a mechanized unit known as the Bloodhounds could be airlifted onto the battlefield. 
The unit consisted of two veteran APCs and two veteran pit bulls. For the Steel Talons, the APCs would be replaced with two veteran Wolverines. The primary weakness of the V-35s was that they were unarmed and only lightly armored. This meant they were highly susceptible to any anti-air weapon systems, including those from non-attack bikes and buggies. If the V-35 was GDI's primary transport during the Third Tiberium War, then the Firehawk was its multi-role fighter bomber. Firehawk docked and ready. The Firehawk is a fast and highly maneuverable VTOL attack jet that can carry air-to-ground or air-to-air -air missiles. Field commanders can make their loadout choices while the Firehawk is on the pad at the airfield. Forward bases with a tech center structure can equip Firehawks with special rocket boosters that allow the aircraft to punch into the stratosphere and go near orbital in order to hop over enemy air defenses. Note that Firehawks are vulnerable to AA fire in the actual target zone during the re-entry after the boost phase. This plane was probably the most advanced aircraft in GDI's arsenal at this time. The Firehawk was a dynamically unstable airframe that required computer control to stay in flight, but the resulting air combat performance was unparalleled. The Firehawk had both a pilot and co-pilot. The onboard AI held pilots with targeting, threat assessment and tracking, weapon control, and navigation. The AI and the pilot worked together seamlessly, combining the best of computer and human. The jet featured folded M-wings, making it excellent for use on an aircraft carrier, taking up less space in the ship's hangar. Most Firehawks were seen parked at a standard airfield or combat support airfield. Using its two Hellcat firebombs, the Firehawk was capable of destroying most enemy structures, or at the very least, significantly damaging them. When needing to deal with Nod or Skrin aircraft, the Firehawk's bombs could be replaced by ground crews with four Rattlesnake missiles. These missiles could be launched at enemy aircraft at range, and quickly bring down Nod Venoms and Vertigo bombers. They were good against Skrin Storm Riders too, though Devastator warships and planetary assault carriers equipped with shields proved to be more challenging. To counter Skrin shields, Firehawks could be upgraded with hard points from the airfield, denoted by the missile rack next to the air control tower, and two additional launchers affixed to the Firehawks' cannons. With hard points, the aircraft could carry a total of six anti-air missiles. When armed with bombs, it would carry three instead of the standard two. Firehawks and Zocom's arsenal would forgo the hard points in exchange for ceramic armor, which made the aircraft more durable, increasing its survivability. As previously mentioned, Firehawks could be equipped with special rocket boosters. If this equipment was purchased, it was placed next to the air control tower at the airfield. Firehawks equipped with these boosters have a blue-white glow emitting from their engines. When Firehawk pilots engage these boosters, their jet flies straight up into the stratosphere. A few moments later, the Firehawk re-enters the troposphere, dropping its bombs or launching its missiles at the designated target. Unlike the V-35s or Orcas, Firehawks could withstand a fair amount of damage before being brought down, especially those equipped with Zocom's ceramic armor. Another unique jet was the Supersonic Fighter. While not a VTOL like the Firehawk, this single-seat, triangular-shaped plane was fast and agile. It was not armed with any bombs or missiles, but was still capable of taking out enemy aircraft. Two of these fighters would sweep down above a single or squadron of aircraft and create a powerful sonic boom. This boom would rip apart light aircraft such as Venoms, instantly destroying them. Larger aircraft like Devastator warships and planetary assault carriers could survive the blast, but not without taking significant damage. The Brotherhood of Nod first discovered these supersonic fighters at a spaceport in the Chilean Blue Zone. Another plane was also discovered, the Ironside Experimental Troop Transport. Based on the designation on its wingtips, this transport was probably known as the X-8. There really isn't any information on this plane, other than its flying wing design and that it was meant to transport troops and supplies. This prototype was ultimately destroyed by the Black Hand during their mission to capture Dr. Giraud. The last aircraft used in GDI's Air Force at this time was the Hammerhead. 
Got, Got the guns. guns. Quoting from the intelligence database, a direct descendant of the assault transport hybrid attack choppers of the 20th century, the large, heavily armored hammerhead was designed to act as a longer range complement to the relatively range limited GDI Orca. Armed with multiple Vulcan cannons and enough space to transport an entire infantry regiment, the Hammerhead's secret weapon is its massive supply storage capacity, allowing the aircraft to operate in the field for days at a time, without needing to either refuel or rearm. The defining feature of the Hammerhead was its NOTAR, meaning no tail rotor, design. Instead, the helicopter utilized twin intermeshing rotors, each spinning in opposite directions in order to counteract the torque produced by each rotor. The helicopter had a pilot and co-pilot, with the co-pilot also acting as the gunner. The vehicle's primary armament were two ball turrets, one located on each wing. Each ball turret was outfitted with two Vulcan cannons that were highly effective against infantry and light armored vehicles. The helicopter was often seen armed with Hellfire rocket pods beneath the wings, though these served no in-game function. The Hammerhead could also be equipped with searchlights beneath its wings, which allowed it to better spot ground units at night. Nod forces raiding the GDI treasury before the start of the Third War had to avoid being noticed by these lights, else their mission could be jeopardized. The most important aspect of the Hammerhead was that it could carry an entire squad of infantry. Unlike the infantry transported by V-35s though, the Hammerhead had ports for its squads to fire their weapons from. This made the Hammerhead a very effective gunship, albeit one that could only be used against ground forces, and not aircraft. Now, the intelligence database said the Hammerhead could transport an entire infantry regiment, but this is clearly a writing mistake by the developers, as a single infantry squad is not equivalent to an entire regiment, which consists of thousands of troops. The Hammerhead's Vulcan cannons could make use of armor-piercing ammo from the command post, further increasing their damage against infantry, light vehicles, and even structures. Just like the Firehawks, Hammerheads and Zocom's arsenal could be outfitted with ceramic armor, further increasing the gunship's durability. GDI's Air Force had its work cut out for it with the sudden invasion of the Skrin during the Third Tiberium War. Though GDI ultimately pulled through and defeated these formidable invaders, the organization would be wise to harness and reverse engineer the surviving Skrin technology in order to improve the initiative's own aircraft. Such a feat would be of paramount importance, should the Skrin decide to launch a second invasion of Earth in the future.